So today I'm going to share with you a sermon given by Francis Grimke in 1936 entitled Christ's Program for the Saving of the World. And this came out of the Faithful Preacher, which I've posted about a couple times, uh, both on Facebook and at the blog. So I just wanted to share this with you. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And, lo, I am always with you, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark sixteen fifteen. These are the words of Jesus after he had laid down his precious life on the cross and had risen triumphant from the grave, uttered just before his ascension. With the full knowledge of conditions, even at their worst, and the words I have read as my text, he outlined his program for salvation for accomplishing the great task for which he had come and for which his kingdom was set up on the earth. It was to redeem the world, to set things right, to bring about changes for the better in all the relations of life. Bear in mind also that at that time, the world was passing through what perhaps was its darkest period morally. Everywhere, things were on the downward grade. Society and all its branches were as rotten to the core, steeped in iniquities of every kind. And yet Jesus, the great optimist, believed it could be redeemed and committed the execution of his plan for its redemption to his followers. To the men who believed in him, who had accepted him as Messiah, and who had associated themselves with him to carry on the glorious undertaking after he was gone. Let us see now what his program is for redeeming a lost world, for bringing about changes for the better. Number one, he says, go. Go and do what? Go and preach the gospel. What is the gospel? What is he referring to particularly? What is it that they were to preach? The great facts set forth in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It is the astounding fact that God, the creator of heaven and earth, was so interested in rescuing men from the power of sin and Satan that he willingly gave his only begotten son, his well-beloved son, to die in order to open a way of escape for the sinner from the guilt and power of sin. Hence the statement, Ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1, 18-19 This gospel message carries with it certain things that must be kept even to the front. For one, the fact of sin and its deadly nature. The disposition now, in a large measure, is to do away with the idea of sin, to do away with it altogether, or to minimize it, explain it away, or attach little or no importance to it. But the gospel conception of sin and its attitude toward it is very different. Sin not only exists, but it is most deadly in character, and if not arrested, will inevitably lead to death, physical death, moral death, spiritual death. One of the things that Jesus lays down as fundamental in his scheme of redemption is that men must realize that they are sinners that they are not living as they ought to live, a God-centered life instead of a self-centered one. The fact of sin in Christ's scheme of redemption is fundamental and must be kept to the front. Men must, be allowed, must not be allowed to forget the fact that they are sinners and that the wages of sin is death. This is a doctrine that men don't like to hear about. They know that they are sinners, but they try to forget it. This is why often they plunge into all kinds of frivolities in order to get away with the serious thought of sin and its fatal consequences. This is why, unfortunately, in order to comply with or not to offend that kind of sentiment, many pulpits have little or nothing to say about sin. 
one thing we may be sure of. As this aspect of man's condition drops out of our preaching, things will steadily grow worse, and men will become more and more set in their evil ways. For if there is no such thing as sin, or no evil consequences to follow, then there is no reason why we shouldn't open all the floodgates of passions and evil inclinations and desires and let things go at full speed. No reason why we should not adopt as our philosophy of life the motto, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. It is to save men from that stupid, stupid, foolish delusion that Christ makes imperative in his plan of rescue the necessity of stressing, and stressing with ever-increasing emphasis, the fact of sin as man's most serious problem. The other thing that is included in the gospel message is the publication of God's plan for the saving of sinners, namely, repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. In Romans 8, 3 through 4, we read, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Jesus said it is the spreading of the knowledge of this great and glorious fact that must go on as a part of his plan for the saving of the world, for bettering conditions. This is what the Apostle Paul had in mind in his first epistle to the Corinthians when he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the gospel is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us who are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And that's from 1 Corinthians 1, 17 through 24. There are still some who feel that this way of saving the world is foolishness. They have other schemes to suggest that they think are better. Number two, notice now what is the next element in his program for saving the world, for bettering conditions. It is contained in the world, in the words, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. It is evident that the change that he wishes to effect for the better is to be brought about in part by teaching. His plan takes both preaching and teaching. And here, we are directed not only to teach, but what we are to teach. It is not secular knowledge that he is here particularly concerned about, important as that kind of knowledge may be. The knowledge he the knowledge he has in mind is that which is contained in the Old Testament scriptures, which he has endorsed as the word of God, supplemented by what he had added of his own and what was still to be added through inspired men, all embodied in what is now known as the Bible, the word of God, embracing both testaments. In this campaign for saving a lost world for bettering conditions, the contents of this book must be carefully studied and taught, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, in season and out of season. Thus we should understand and see that careful provision is made under competent teachers for the study of the Word of God. The importance of teaching the Word of God as a part of the regular program of saving men, of improving conditions around us, will be manifest to anyone who stops and thinks for a moment. The object of this teaching is to familiarize men with the contents of Scripture, with the contents of the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. What a book the Bible is! Where in all the world's literature will you find such a storehouse of knowledge and wisdom? Where will you find such sublime ideas about God, such noble standards of living? 
Open it anywhere, and how the light flashes in upon us from as from no other source. Take the Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the warnings and exhortations found in the Gospels and the Epistles, and above all, the glorious character and life of Jesus Christ. What greater influence could be brought to bear upon the uplift of humanity, upon changing things for the better, than a knowledge of the contents of the book widely diffused. This seems to be foreshadowed by what the prophet Isaiah says in 11.9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. With the diffusion of the knowledge of God through the circulation of this book of God, wonderful things are promised and wonderful changes for the better do occur when God's word is carefully taught among the people. In an address recently delivered by Dr. John R. Mott in connection with the American Bible Society's celebration of the 100th anniversary of its labors in China, these words occur. De Quincey said that all literature is divided into the literature of knowledge and the literature of power. The Bible constitutes preeminently the literature of power. I am not a mystic. I wish I were more so. I certainly am not suspicious. But how often I have observed that this literature, when intelligently studied, expounded, and applied, seems to vibrate with power not of this world. You ask, what kind of power? Well, power to shape conscience, to make conscience afraid, perchance, at times, to create conscience. On my trip down to South America, I put the question to a group of students. What is the greatest obstacle to Christianity? One of them quickly replied, the Ten Commandments, by which he meant that the commandments expounded and applied shape conscience, create conviction of sin, and necessitate radical changes. Moreover, they help to keep conscience sensitive and responsive. In fact, I find that when I am where there is the greatest responsiveness to duty and high idealism, I am where there has been the most faithful application as well as interpretation and acceptance of these sacred writings. The Bible has power to energize the will. In one of my students' evangelistic campaigns in Australia, a Jewish student made the striking remark to me after one of my addresses. These writings do not only hold up high ideals to me, they afford teachings that my reason accepts, but they also make me want to obey them. That is, they communicate divine impulses as well as persuasion of mind, moving of the heart, and kindling of the imagination. Yes, power to energize the will from palsy into high efficiency. And yet, how often we find men in our pulpits searching heaven and earth for something new to preach, for something new to preach about, while this treasure house of wisdom and knowledge of the things necessary to salvation is neglected, passed by, and overlooked. Dr. Alexander McLaren, the great Bible student and expositor, was once asked the best way to study the Bible. Clenching his fist and bringing it down on the table, he said, Dig, 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 dig down into its meaning. Yes, said the inquirer. But what then, doctor? He replied again, Dig, dig, dig again. But that is just what so many of us are not willing to do, and why we wander off into so many strange fields in search of materials for our pulpit ministrations. Number three. Another element in this redemptive program of Jesus is this preaching and teaching are to be carried into all the world and to all nations. His aim is to carry the blessings of salvation to the whole human race. The great missionary fields lying beyond us must also claim our attention in working out this great plan of redemption. To be interested in home missions is not enough. We must think of those on the foreign field as well. The command is, go ye into all the world. And only as our sympathy goes out to all are we exhibiting his spirit or obeying his command. The fourth thing to which attention is directed in this redemptive program of Jesus is contained in the words, And, lo, 
I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Jesus had committed to his apostles a tremendous task, a task involving great responsibilities, dangers, and hardships. These men had been accustomed to his, head, his leadership, to looking to him for everything. Now he is going to leave them, to be no longer visibly among them. What will they do without him in the hour of need, when troubles come, when dangers assail them, when they are confronted on all sides by bitter and relentless enemies? He tells them, Do not be afraid. Though no longer visible, I will still be with you. And you will notice he not only says, I am, will be with you, but always, i.e., at all times and under all circumstances. And even more, he goes on to say that he would be with them until the end of the world. There will be no time when I will not be with you. To the eye of sense, he would be away. But to the eye of faith, he would be still among them and still available for every need. The appeal was clearly to their faith. They knew him. They knew he could be trusted, that his word could be relied upon. And with his word to rely upon, they went forth confident that he would be with them. And he was with them. And it was by his being with them and working with them and through them that mighty things were done. The mighty works were accomplished. Five, one thing more is contained in these words that we are considering. Outlining his program for saving the world, for bettering conditions, it is contained in the very first part of the great announcement. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That is an amazing statement for anyone to make. But Jesus made it. And from what we know of his character, he never would have made it if it had not been true. And the more we think of it, the more astounding does it seem. It is not, mark you, some power in heaven and in earth, but all power in heaven and in earth. I am calling attention to the stupendous accession of power on the part of Jesus as a guarantee to us of all needed help in the prosecution of this work of redeeming the world. All power is contained unto him. Nothing lies beyond his reach. His resources are adequate for every need. No task, therefore, is too great to undertake in his name. No difficulties too hard to be encountered and overcome, and no enemies too formidable to fear. We need and have no fear, therefore, in going forth in his name. No fear. As to support, so many of us, in doing the Lord's work, put the matter of support first and make everything else subservient to our creature comfort, fearing to do anything or say anything that might result in cutting off supplies, forgetful of the fact that God has promised to take care of his workers. All we have to do is to be faithful in doing the work committed to us. If we seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, the things necessary to creature comforts will be supplied. That is the promise. Nor need we have any fear as to opposition. Paul said, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6.12 he was not afraid, however, to go forth in the strength of the Lord to encounter the enemy. So in all our encounters with the forces of evil and the service of the Lord, we may always hear, sounding in our ears, the assuring words, Fear not, fear not, lo, I am always with you. And now, a word more in bringing this discourse to a close. Two things I have had in mind in the preparation and preaching of it. 1. To call attention specifically to Christ's program for saving the world, for bringing about changes for the better in individuals and in communities, and the whole structure of society and all human relationships. It is by preaching the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. It is by teaching, teaching not the philosophy of science or any special dis department of human knowledge, but teaching what is written in the scriptures, the word of God given by holy men as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
it is making known the contents of the Bible that Jesus here links up with the work of saving the world, of bringing about changes for the better in all human relations and conditions. And two, my purpose in the preparation and preaching of this discourse is to call attention to the fact that though the plan, as here outlined, is perfect, is in every way adapted to accomplish the object for which it was intended, and has been in operation for nearly 2,000 years, comparatively little, compared to what might have been done, has been accomplished. There seems to be just as much evil in the world today as there ever was. The devil seems to be just as firmly entrenched in power today as in the days of Christ. This much may be said, however. While wickedness still goes on, while the broad way that leads to death is still crowded, there are a great many more good people in the world today. People who are really trying to do right. People who have been influenced by the spirit and teachings of Jesus Christ than when his kingdom was set up centuries ago. Some changes for the better and some very remarkable changes have taken place under its operation. operations. This world is still wicked. Yes, very, very wicked. But there are a great many more people now who can be counted on the side of righteousness than before. Jesus sent out his disciples with instructions to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever he had commanded them. Something has been accomplished, though not as much as might have been expected. And I want to stop just a moment to tell you why so little has been accomplished. It is because those who have been entrusted with carrying out his program have to a very large extent been recurrent to the trust committed to them. How many of our ministers have been following faithfully and earnestly the program here laid down by the master? How faithfully have they been preaching the gospel? They have preached on almost everything except Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God whose blood alone cleanses from sin. The thought of sin from which we need to be saved has largely dropped out of most of our preaching. How many of our ministers have sought carefully to expound the word of God, setting forth clearly before the people the teachings of the inspired volume concerning character and conduct, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, in season and out of season. People attend the churches, but rarely are their consciences pricked they attend the churches but hear little about their sins and shortcomings. They attend the churches but their self-complacency is never disturbed by what they hear, or at least rarely. They hear and go away feeling no sense of lack on their part and no wish or desire to live more worthily than they are living. Divine unrest rarely stirs within them. No welling up of great and ennobling desires is awakened within them. The people listen and go away to gossip, to tattle, to keep on in their evil ways. Louis the Fourteenth is reported as having once said once to Bisset, the court preacher, How is it that when I hear the other great court preachers, I go away delighted, but when I hear you, I go away greatly dissatisfied with myself? Alas, alas. Too many of our preachers, like the other court preachers, send the people away delighted by dealing in glittering generalities and by keeping as far away as possible from the sins that beset them, the sins of which they are guilty. Under much of the preaching that is heard, nobody goes away greatly dissatisfied with himself or herself. That kind of preaching may bring popularity to the preacher, but leanness to the souls of the hearers. How many of our preachers feed their souls on the word of God and always draw their sermons and exhortations from the word of God? The reason there has not been more progress in saving the world is because we have not been doing what we have been directed to do. We have not been preaching the gospel and teaching the people out of the word of God, as we ought to have been doing. And things will never be any better until we swing in line with the plan as laid here by, the G by Jesus Christ. Under this plan, every evil now afflicting both old and young will be reached and effectively reached. Under this plan, therefore, every church ought to be operating. Nothing should be allowed to go on in it or under its direction that does not have one or both of these ends in view. 
the turning of men from their evil ways and attaching them to the Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, or the bringing of them under the power and influence of some Bible truth. Every meeting should have some object in view. Every sermon, every address or exhortation should be keyed to the same definite aims and purposes. When all of our churches and all of our ministers realize what the work is to which they are called and get busy doing it, then, and not until then, will changes for the better take place. Will the kingdom of God come and come with power? The more we get away from gospel in our preaching and away from the teaching of the scriptures in regard to character and conduct, the greater will, the greater will be the swing away from the things that are true, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. What we need most of all is a faithful, courageous, consecrated ministry that will stick close to the word of God in all its ministrations and in dependence upon the Holy Spirit to make effective the word preached and taught. Such is Christ's program for saving the world, and it can't be improved upon. The world can be saved in no other way. Dr. Joseph Parker, the great London preacher, laying the cornerstone of a church in London, once said, I do not want every man to preach in the same way as I do, but I want every man to preach the same gospel. Believe me, nothing but the gospel will stand the wear and tear of experience and evolution and rivalry. Ministers of London, be faithful to your Savior, and he will be faithful to you. Invent some superficial gospel of your own, and your efforts will end in disappointment and mockery. Preach the gospel of the Son of God, and you will find that it is the power unto salvation. Those are timely words for preachers everywhere, and never more so than today. Christ's program for saving a lost world needs to be revived and pushed with vigor. Everywhere. Throughout the whole church, this note for renewed effort to carry out Christ's program for saving the world ought to be sounded, and all the forces gotten in line for its execution. We need to wake up to the fact that we are not here to play, to dream, to drift. We have hard work to do and loads to lift. If we are not going to preach the gospel and teach the word of God faithfully, we have no business in the ministry. And the sooner we get out of it, the better. The question is, sometimes asked, what is to be the future of Christianity as it comes into competition with other religions and with communism, nationalism, capitalism, and all antagonistic forces? To my mind, there is absolutely no need to worry about that matter. Jesus said, after hearing Peter's great confession, upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. And in Revelation 6, 2, we also read, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. And in Revelation 1, 17 through 18, we read, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. We read also, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain. In Zechariah 4, 6-7. And in Daniel we read, A stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image, and became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. Daniel 2, 34 through 35. The only thing that we need to be concerned about is to see that we carry out faithfully the instructions of our Lord, that we be true to the solemn trust committed to us, that we go on preaching the gospel, that we go on teaching his word, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, in season and out of season, and give ourselves no concern about its future. Its future is assured. God is behind it. It cannot fail. Let us stop worrying about the future of Christianity and get down to the hard work in carrying out the instructions of our Lord. Amen.